George Lawson, Library Director here in Ames, and with me today is Farwell Brown, historiographer for the city of Ames. We're going to discuss today two of the key figures in early Ames history, John I. Blair and Oaks Ames. We're having this discussion on the balcony of the library, uh, a very suitable place because behind us is a portrait of John I. Blair, recently acquired on permanent loan by Farwell Brown in the library. Uh, Farwell, can you tell us a little bit about John Blair and Oaks Ames? Well, I'd be glad to tell you a few things that uh, I have found out about these two interesting men. They, these men had uh, reached their prime about the time that the Civil War came to an end, and they had a great deal to do with, uh, with our city being where it is and, and being named what it, what it was and what it is. Had everything to do with had it, Had everything I guess. to do with it, yeah. right. Uh, we'll start with John I. Blair. Um, Blair probably had, uh, had more to do with some of these things. But John I. Blair uh, was uh, born in uh, New Jersey in 1802. Uh, I'd like to uh, refer, however, to the advice that his father gave him when he was only 13 years old and uh, uh, took him aside and told him that from that point on he was going to have to make his own living and make his own way. And he had just one bit of advice for him, and that was to work hard and be honest and fear the Lord. You say that was age 12? Age 13. 13. Right. Well, and later in life, uh, John I. Blair said that those were the words that were his guiding light the rest of his days, and he uh, tried to adhere to them. Well, John I. Blair, uh, as I indicated, had to, to get out on his own very early in life. The Blair family were not wealthy people. In fact, they were regarded as rather poor people at the time. He was born on a farm as I indicated in New Jersey, up in the northeast corner of, of the state, just a few little distance from the uh, uh, Delaware River, across from Pennsylvania. Okay. And uh, being on a farm, uh, he worked on a farm for part of the time when he was as early as 11. But when he was 13, his father took him to a cousin's store and he worked in that store a while, and uh, before very long, he saw other opportunities that uh, took him into uh, storekeeping. And uh, it, it turned out that, that he picked up an interest in, in business, apparently. Uh, he studied business on his own, and uh, he expanded and eventually owned his own store. This is after starting out working for some right. family. Right, working for, for, well, a cousin to begin with and then yeah. other people. And uh, when he had his own store, he branched out and actually uh, was operating several stores in different towns around in that area of New Jersey. As a matter of fact, it's been pointed out that uh, he was almost a forerunner of the kind of operations we have today like Walmart and Kmart, because he was buying in large quantity and selling at uh, lower prices, and he was, he was a competitor for many of the operations of that type in the area. But before very long, he became interested in uh, uh, other things and uh, became interested in uh, foundries and manufacture the production of iron, and okay. uh, became interested in uh, getting coal from Pennsylvania, and uh, that led him into an interest in railroading. He, uh, Those two kind of went hand in hand. Uh, if you right. had coal, you needed to ship it, and if you had right. the tra uh, transportation, you needed to haul. That's right. And his first experience uh, with railroading and, and actual construction was building a railroad from Pennsylvania to New Jersey to bring the coal to uh, his blast furnaces and his foundries in New Jersey. Okay. And the Lackawanna Railroad was an outgrowth of that uh, activity. In fact, the Lackawanna was the first railroad that he was ever a stockholder in. Where do we get that name, Lackawanna? Is that a city someplace? You know, I, I think I'd have to say that I don't know for sure where you Lackawanna You mean I actually stumped you? You, got, you did. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> was it a river or was it a city? <laughs> we'll have to call the reference desk yeah, and find out. Right, downstairs. Well. John I. Blair, um, as I indicated, became interested in railroading. And uh, before we take him out of the state of New Jersey, uh, uh, let me mention one interesting fact. He uh, 
uh, was born and raised near this little town, the name of which I have forgotten. But by the time he was much, not much over age 35, the town was, uh, had so much respect for him that they changed the name of the town. They changed it to Blairstown. So if we just think of Blairstown as his hometown, why well, you, you're, you're safe. You're safe, and okay. that's up there right where he, near where he was born. Well, by uh, 1860, uh, he's up in his later 40s. That's 58. No, let's see, yeah, he'd be 58 by this time. Okay. Uh, he had become acquainted with Oaks Ames, who we're going to talk about a little bit uh, later. And uh, being a Republican, uh, he was active in uh, Republican activities in New Jersey, and he was elected to be a, a delegate to the National Convention in Chicago. Okay. And uh, at Chicago, uh, he uh, again met Oaks Ames, but he also met Abraham Lincoln, which is sort of important too, uh, because uh, he personally uh, went to Springfield after the convention and uh, to congratulate uh, Abraham Lincoln upon his nomination. Uh, that's worth mention because uh, that shows the kind of a man he was. He, he, uh, he was interested in people and he was, he was also careful to uh, acquaint himself with, with the important people uh, of the day. See. Was that as, was that from a business point of view or for interest in politics? Well, I think maybe it was both. Both. But I have a feeling that probably I haven't read this, but probably they talked railroading a little bit there sure. too. You know. Sure. But uh, following the uh, convention uh, at uh, Oaks Ames uh, invitation, he came on to Iowa. So he first entered the state of Iowa in 1860 and uh, was very much impressed with the possibilities for railroad building in the state of Iowa. And I might indicate that uh, from a, the time he was a boy, and you can, from this brief, uh, these brief comments, you can see how he developed and how he grew and, and how he, he would seem to be successful at everything he did. But uh, after he got to Iowa and saw these opportunities, uh, it is no surprise that uh, by the time that uh, he had uh, exercised his interest in the state of Iowa, he was known, he would become known as the Railroad King of, of Iowa because he built the uh, Chicago Northwestern, then known as the uh, Cedar Rapids and uh, Missouri River Railroad. Okay. He built that line. Uh, it had already been constructed. Uh, a railroad had been constructed as far as Clinton, from Clinton, I should say, to Cedar Rapids, and then he finished it from from uh, Cedar Rapids through this area where we are to Council Bluffs. Well, uh, I think that uh, uh, my next uh, step with John I. Blair is to tell you how, in 1863. Uh, he met uh, Oaks Ames at Cedar Rapids. They had arranged to uh, go together. This uh, is in the midst of the Civil War. Midst of the Civil War. Sure. And uh, people, including Abraham Lincoln, I might mention, uh, had, uh, had spoken a time or two by 1863 of the possibility that uh, the, a transcontinental railway system might be built after the war when we got through this terrible war that would help heal the country and unite the country, uh, uh, unify the East and the West. So uh, uh, Oaks Ames met, it was in June of 1863, met with uh, John I. Blair and together with uh, several of Blair's uh, associates, W.W. W. Walker of Chicago, another engineer, uh, they came by train as far as Marcetown, and um, that was the end of the line. That was the end of the line at that time, and then by stage they came on west. Uh, they would have come through Nevada. They were working on the railroad, probably about as far as Nevada in 1863, and then they would have come past the little town of Bloomington, as you've heard about up here northeast of Ames. Okay. There used to be a little town up there. Set up what's called Stagecoach Road. Right. Right. Okay. It's up there, and uh, uh, there was no Ames here, of course, there's no town down here, but there was a college that was planned to be out here. Uh, the farmhouse had been built three years earlier, you okay. may recall, 1860, 61. And uh, while we don't know, uh, the, don't have any uh, 
something written that tells us that they came across the Squaw Creek in any one place, but we can well imagine that they probably crossed somewhere on a plank bridge down here and may have made a stop at the farmhouse because it was there and it was customary for stagecoaches to go that way in 1863. We know that. And so uh, Blair and Ames came this way. We don't know what they might have said, but it's interesting to sort of wonder what they said to each other as they went across this swampy land. Because just one year later, John Ayer Blair was directing his, uh, one of his surveyors, one of his engineers, to plant a little town and put it right down here between the Squaw and the Skunk River. And he was going to build a railroad across here, and he told him to plant that little town, and he told him to put a name on it. And that name was Ames. Huh. And that was just about a year, a year and a two or three months after they came through here. And, uh, but the college was planned. It wasn't there. It wasn't it was there. Planned. The yeah. farmhouse right. would have been there, but uh, right. And it was still six more years before classes would open on the campus. But the farmhouse think, and the farm buildings were there. Do you think the the planned college would have had uh, uh, figured in their uh, idea of establishing uh, uh, the rail line through here? I, I think definitely that would have been the case. Sure. They had been buying right away for the railroad over in the Nevada area, of course, and they'd bought some of it on this way. But in 1864, they were actively buying the right of way where we are, right through here and right north of the college, right north of the college campus. So 1863 and four was the time when the railroad was being uh, definitely located uh, through here. Yes, the college would have been a big factor, I would think. And, uh, but there were other factors. That is, the land was cheaper here and it was easier to cross the river where the land was low and things sure. like that. And, uh, Aside from the fact that the land was cheaper down here, see, so where well, it was a little swamp. A swamp yeah. yeah, right. Well, uh, I'd like to uh, go on and uh, point out that, uh, as I indicated, he, his education ended at the age of 11. Uh, <clears throat> but he uh, became one of the most talented railroad builders of his day. It's said that he built more miles of railroad in the state of Iowa than any other one man. and. Uh, uh, he, he was on the cutting edge, you might say. He was on the front uh, frontier of the railroad building at that time. He was man, a man that was in the field, and he associated with the workers. He worked with the men that worked on the, on the railroad. He, so he wasn't back in New Jersey in the office. He right. was out here. He was out here. Uh, you mentioned office. His, he established an office in Cedar Rapids, from which he did work uh, during this time period. But uh, he bought interest in railroads. Uh, little railroads and put them together. It said that all together he, uh, he literally owned 17 different railroad lines during his day. Well, it's interesting you yeah. mentioned Cedar Rapids. There's a Blair's Ferry Road yeah. in Cedar Rapids. I'm right. sure that's where it comes from. And one so. time, at one time there was a Blair's building or a Blair building over okay. there. But um, the, uh, he was very much uh, involved in, in the, the construction. But aside from that, you have to keep in mind that he was a man who uh, saw the importance of being in touch with, with the leaders of the area. He would have known the political er leaders in the state of Iowa, I'm sure. And uh, he knew the uh, uh, people, uh, he socialized with people. Okay. And uh, I might uh, mention that as he went along, uh, he not only located Ains, but he located other towns and they not only decided that uh, and instructed his engineers to put the uh, aims on here. He told them to put veil on veil, and he named altogether uh, some 40 or 50 towns through in Iowa mostly and some in Nebraska. Okay. So, uh, but Ames, of course, is the one that he named that became the largest and the most important, of course. Iowa place names have some interesting origins. Yep. Railroad, railroad uh, magnates. Yeah. accounted for, uh, our railroad engineers accounted for quite a few Iowa town names. That's right. As a matter of fact, John I. Blair, you find Blairstown, Blairsburg, and Blair, Nebraska, to mention a few of the towns that carry his name. As a matter of fact, he named some of the streets in Ames, and Douglas Avenue that the library is on, was a railroad builder of, of uh, George W. Blair, or George W. Uh, Douglas, Douglas, for example. And George W. Douglas owned one of the lots right where the library is today. And it's interesting, he yeah. spelled his name with two S's at two the S's. end, and the street used to have two S's 
at the end that's as right. well. That's right. And uh, but uh, George W. Douglas was a friend of John I. Blair, and I think there are other names. And of course, the Duff name and the Kellogg name were people that he dealt with in connection with buying the land. Now, so, yeah. Yeah. Blair bought the land that was originally platted as Ames from Cynthia Duff. From Cynthia O. Duff, whom we talked about it at another time. Sure, and yeah. and so a lot of people, if they go look at their that live in the central part of town look at their abstract on their home, we'll find that they live in Blair's edition. That's right. Okay. Yep. And that's the original plan yeah. of Ames. That's right. Okay. But in uh, going back to uh, what I said at the early beginning about his uh, advice that his father gave him, he was sure. a religious man, and uh, he, he believed strongly in, in education. And it probably partly because he didn't have much formal education himself. He saw the need for it, saw the value of it. And uh, he became a philanthropist. We might add that to his repertoire. He was not only a builder and contractor and so forth, but he uh, he he gave it said over five million dollars to educational and religious he institutions. Was a Presbyterian. He was a Presbyterian. Yeah, I remember, right? He endowed the Blair Academy in his hometown of Blair's town. Uh, yeah, Blairstown, uh, New Jersey. Okay. He's still operating on. Under the, with the funds that he set up for them. We've spoken to the people at the Academy and researching uh, the artist that did this right. portrait behind us. Right. Well, it's a coeducational Academy. And uh, he also uh, gave money to, a considerable amount of money to Princeton University. In Iowa, he gave money to Grinnell and to Cole College. And uh, uh, right here in Ames, uh, when uh, the Congregational Church was being uh, uh, built, in 1865, you remember the town was, the first house was built in 1865, uh, and they were planning and uh, getting ready to build a, uh, a congregational church here. He gave the lots for the congregational church. That was the first church in Ames. That's right. Okay. And uh, he also gave a, uh, made a monetary contribution, I think maybe of two or three hundred dollars to, uh, for that new church. Uh, one thing he did that's sort of interesting, and uh, others of that era did the same thing, he put a reversionary clause in all the deeds. See, all of the deeds in the original town of Ames were originally owned by John I. Blair, or the Blair Land Company. And in every single deed, the first owner had a reversionary clause in there that provided that if uh, alcoholic beverages were ever sold or consumed on that lot, that the title would revert to John I. Blair Land Company. Uh, so that uh, that, of course, uh, went by the boards because any kind of reversionary uh, clause in a warranty deed, I believe, has been ruled unconstitutional. But every lot in the city of Ames and the other towns that he laid out contained such a clause. That's an odd proposition. Well, he, he was a, uh, a t uh, he was a, uh, what do you call it, a teetotaler sure. all, his, all his days. Huh. And uh, likewise, uh, uh, other people did the same thing at the same time. Uh, Josiah Grinnell put that provision in every lot deed in the city of Grinnell, too. So, uh, but I thought that was rather interesting to note that. But most important of all about John I. Blair, and I'll close with this on him, okay. and that is that uh, he left his name and he left his handiwork all across Iowa. And uh, uh, I uh, would like to conclude by just pointing out that Ames, I said it a moment ago, was the largest of the towns, the most important of the towns, of course, that he named in Iowa or Nebraska, but it's the headquarters of one of the great uh, educational institutions in this country, and I sort of wonder if maybe he didn't look down the line and uh, if he didn't have some idea that something like this might happen. But he was a forward-looking man and uh, unique in many ways. Maybe we'll take a minute and reference the portrait that uh, uh, we has come to the public library, thanks uh, mm -hmm. in great part to your efforts and mentioned that uh, the portrait of uh, Mr. Blair is on permanent loan to us from the Wesley Foundation in Des Moines. They operate Wesley Acres and several other retirement homes. It's an affiliate of the Methodist Church. And you spotted this portrait in the mm -hmm. lobby of Wesley Acres on a visit there some years ago, isn't that right? Yeah, that's, that's right, yeah. And how did they <clears throat> come to have this portrait? Well, I understand it was given to uh, to them by a, uh, a nephew, a grandnephew, I suppose it would have been, 
who had uh, who had a relative who resided in that on the premises of Wesley Acres, and that's how they happened to have the portrait. And they'd done some remodeling and construction there, and found that and taken they had taken this down, this portrait down, and had it in storage when you first asked them if they might not be willing to make loan of it to, to the library. Right, that's right. And we were able to visit with those folks and uh, arrange a, what we call a permanent loan that they can ask for it back at any time. It's still their, their property, but it's ours to enjoy now and for as long as we can foresee. Yeah. Well, now should we turn to Oaks Ames? Our namesake. Yes. Sure. Now, I'm uh, going to short out the time here a little bit, I think, uh, and move quickly. Oaks Ames was born uh, just about a year and a half after John A. Blair. So you see we had men of the same age, approximately. Contemporaries. And they were about, uh, he was, uh, Oaks Ames was, what, 58 or 59 when they came out here in 1863. Okay. And uh, uh, John A. Blair would have been 60. You see, that shows you their, how similar they were in age. Well, Oaks Ames was from Massachusetts. He was born, in, as I indicated, in 1804. Uh, he and his brother uh, first engaged in the manufacture of uh, shovels and picks and things of that sort. That had been their father's business. They took over that business. You can still buy implements of that type with the, the, with the name names, names on it. That's yes. right. Mm -hmm. uh, although I'm not sure that just exactly what the genealogy is sure. there. But uh, it, it's Massachusetts oriented and uh, there's some connection I would have to think. Well. Uh, the gold rush of the 1849s uh, really made the uh, Ames brothers, uh, Oakes and uh, Oliver, a wealthy man because they sent many sh uh, picks and shovels from Massachusetts to the uh, coal, uh, or not coal, the uh, gold uh, fields of uh, the West. Um, but uh, we'll move along in 1863, uh, the same year that Oakes Ames came out to Iowa, that's the year he was elected to Congress in the House of Representatives in the U.S. Congress from the state of Massachusetts. And uh, he had already become interested in railroads. And uh, uh, he, uh, I can well imagine that in his uh, pick and shovel business, uh, he had uh, been out through some of this area and he knew the needs for railroads, and I think he had bought stock in railroads by this time. And, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, he, had been he had been a delegate, uh, as, as uh, Blair had been from New Jersey, he had been a delegate from Massachusetts to that 1860 Republican Convention. And uh, he too had talked with Abraham Lincoln and probably Blair and, and others, and so, uh, uh, he, we know that he had this, uh, this interest himself in, in railroads, but he was from the investor side, you see. Okay, and, and um, Blair was the construction. Right. Okay. Uh, in 1863, we've already talked about the fact that they got together in Iowa and came out this way and they traveled by stagecoach and through this Ames area. And they were surveying land for That's a right. route. It was Blair. Blair had probably invited him because he had a good chance to see what they were doing. This is the way Blair operated, you know. And uh, Oaks Ames would have been vitally interested. And uh, in fact, Oaks Ames had bought stock in the Missouri and uh, or the Cedar Rapids and Missouri River Railroad by this time. And um, the um, it pictures to be a grand expedition. Here they yeah. are, out kind of on. Do, taking care of some work, but also seeing the country and, and, and having a lark with their brother, uh, uh, right. uh, oh, uh, Ames brothers, or Blair's brothers. Blair's brothers, brothers yeah. Okay. yeah. And uh, as a matter of fact, both Blair, I think I'm right on this, but I have checked some of this, uh, both Blair and Ames had sons who later uh, came out in this area around Boone, the coal mining area, see. Okay. And uh, several years ago, we found a, uh, a friend of mine here in Ames, I should say, found a uh, tool chest that was uh, identified as an antique over in Boone with the name O. Ames on it. Oh, really? We don't know for sure whether it was Oliver or Oaks or which one it was, but it's got O. Ames on it Gosh. in that area. Well, anyway, uh, Oaks Ames came through here. So <coughs> somebody asked if uh, Oaks Ames was ever in Ames. No, he never was in Ames, but he went right through the area. 
weeks, yeah. just less than two years before the town was laid out. And, uh, and so that uh, I think it's, it's really uh, uh, worth knowing that uh, the gentleman was here once. Whether there were any, uh, whether, whether there was anybody else here or, or not. not. Yeah, sure. right. Sure. Uh, the, uh, it was Ames' interest in the expansion of the railroad westward that led him to support and to personally become involved in some of the federal legislation uh, that assured the financial support and the uh, actual uh, expansion into beyond, we'll say, beyond Omaha, particularly the Union Pacific Railroad. And um, this is what uh, led him into uh, uh, buying stock in a, an organization known as the Credit Mobile Air. And that is what in turn led him into a, uh, uh, a situation that uh, was quite painful and embarrassing for him. And I'd just like to spend just a moment about that. The Credit Mobile Air was a large page in American history. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah Oaks Ames, uh, uh, bought stock in the Credit Mobile Air, which was a Pennsylvania corporation. It was not a, a federal. Uh, it was incorporated in the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, their purpose was to sell stock to raise money to, in turn, build railroads. And so they were the uh, ones that actually, I understand, contracted for the construction of much of the Union Pacific Railroad. And they, in turn, would then sell the constructed railroad yeah. to the Union Pacific. Yeah, that's right, when completed. Okay. I, I won't try to detail accurately how, how this transpired, but yes, that's the route that, that the, I understand took place. It all took place. And uh, anyway, he bought stock, and with all of his enthusiasm, he uh, bought more stock in the Credit Mobile Air than he said he would really want, because he wanted to share it with some of his friends in Congress. See. And uh, he uh, would offer it to, uh, he did offer it to, to anyone who wanted to buy at par. And uh, At par, and that means what he, what paid, he paid for. What he paid for, it, as we could say it that way. and. Uh, uh, some 15 or 20 uh, members of uh, Congress did buy stock from him. Well, this led to his being uh, criticized because uh, uh, it had a little bit of a tone of, uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, Conflict of interest? Well, uh, trying to, uh, the word. Influence. To influence, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, but anyway, uh, he w he, this led to his being charged uh, in Congress and their hearings held lengthy hearings, and his defense was that uh, the legislation that uh, supported the building of the, of the railroads, the West, uh, Union Pacific in particular, uh, had all been taken care of before this happened. See, in other words, there wasn't anything pending. He wasn't trying to buy somebody's vote. Uh, the other thing was that, uh, that uh, the corporation, the Mobile Air Corporation, was not a federal corporation. It didn't come under any existing laws. Therefore, there was nothing illegal anyway. And I think he was right on both points uh, at that, that point. There were other uh, things about it that uh, there isn't time to go into, uh, but the Mobile Air had profited in their transactions with the Union Pacific, and the Union Pacific had benefited by uh, funds from the federal government. All this was true. and. But again, uh, he, he thought this, there was nothing really wrong. But he, they still uh, discredited him, and he re had to resign. They didn't put him out, but he did uh, leave he did Congress. Resign. I think he resigned, but he, he uh, left Congress, an embarrassed man and uh, much uh, somewhat broken-hearted man, and died in uh, 